about how to talk to somebody who's in their language and how to read their language well and how to teach the person to respect God but still have love and respect for morality. In most cases, editing. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming out on this evening. Uh, very grateful to have some people to process all of this, uh, not only this night, but the, uh, the days to come. I hope that what we participate in will get all of our, our hearts and minds thinking as we head into this week. Come on in, everybody. Um, a couple things. Uh, one, a shameless plug, uh, there's a book table as you leave today, and so if you're curious about some of the stuff that um, Rick has written, he has a book table, and I'll let them talk about it at some point, but uh, our two guests tonight are actually writing a book together, and so they can uh, maybe give a shameless plug uh, to their book. Um, so I know Rick... Um, from years of ministry, uh, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, I talked to Rick and said, you know, 
it'd be really fun. Years ago, Faith Covenant Church had a debate between a Christian and an atheist here on uh, this stage, and uh, I've heard resonance of that over the years, that it was very positive. I thought, well, why don't we do that again? Rick happened to know Tom, and um, this was actually quickly set up. One of the kind of fun things is that Tom was very eager to join the conversation. Um, I'm not going to talk anymore because there's much to cover. What I've asked each of them to do is, well, I'll give you the format. Um, I've asked each of them to introduce the other because they know each other better than I know each of them in their context of their, uh, what they're doing. Um, Rick is going to perf uh, perform, present. <laughs> present first. Tom will present second. Uh, Rick uh, will then respond. And then Tom will then respond. And then we'll do Q&A. Uh, we're going to go till 8 o'clock. We're going to get to 8 o'clock. And you're going to go, oh my goodness, there's still so much more to talk about. And that's okay, because then we can do it again sometime, right? All right. Uh, Rick? Introduce your friend Tom. I don't need this to do that. I met Tom Jump about 10 years ago when I got an email from a guy who said, I'm an atheist, I'm interested in engaging Christians and what they think and going back and forth a bit. Could we get together? So we did. We got together in a restaurant here in the South Metro, and I made a new friend. And we've been kind of talking back and forth ever since and now writing a book together, which is the topic of tonight. The book is on ethics, a naturalistic understanding of ethics versus a Christian theistic understanding of ethics. And it's, it's, a cool, it's a cool debate back and forth in the book. Anyway, Tom grew up in Minneapolis, and his parents are here. Hello to his parents. So greetings to you. Um, and Tom has a very successful YouTube channel with uh, how many followers now? Yeah, 32,000 followers. And on this channel, he debates Christians and other theists and debates other people. And I have debated him a couple of times on his uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so I'm just very glad to be introducing Tom. Tom Jump. So it's my job to introduce Rick to you guys. And I was not prepared for this, so I had to write this, and I don't have it memorized, so I apologize. I'm going to read it from my phone. Rick Matson has been serving with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship since 1981, dedicating his career to equipping students and leaders on college campuses across the country. With a master's degree in philosophy of religion from Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, Rick has become a passionate speaker and trainer in apologetics helping others engage thoughtfully with their faith in both academic and everyday contexts. Rick and his wife Sharon live in St. Paul, where they deeply involved in church, Grace Church, Grace church in Roseville. Sharon serves in music and women's ministry, while Rick is a member of the teaching team. Together, they are proud parents of two children and seven grandchildren. On a personal note, I was diagnosed with major depression and social anxiety, and Rick was one of the first people I reached out to on my journey to overcome anxiety and depression. And through his grace and kindness, I was able to begin to feel more comfortable spending time with and speaking with other people. Rick has played a major role in helping me to get to where I am today. Rick Matson. Just want to thank Brad Kindle for setting this up. For Faith Covenant Church, where I've spoken a few times, it's good to be back with you folks, and just thank Tom, uh, too, for this, this evening. My goal is to be a truth seeker, not just a defender of some ideology. Uh, so maybe following someone like uh, Antony Flew, who in the 20th century was a famous atheist philosopher, and he always had his goal and his rule to follow the evidence and follow the arguments wherever they went. And Flew, late in his life, actually converted over to believing in God. And that's not my point. My point is that it seems like we all need to be truth seekers. So having someone on the other side, someone who actually provides another perspective in a thoughtful way and can critique my side, helps me to be a truth seeker and not just an ideologue. In other words, you know an ideologue is someone who just defends an, I an ideology no matter what. Don't confuse me with the facts. I believe what I believe. I don't want to live my life that way. That's why I'm in this 
relationship, well, not the relationship, because there's other parts of the relationship that are good, but that's one of the benefits of this relationship, is to try and be a truth seeker. So as we talk tonight about theistic ethics, theistic meaning God-centered ethics, and in my case, biblical Christian uh, theology, theism, I think it's important to define what we mean by God. What I mean by God when I talk about God is that God is Trinitarian. In other words, this is the ancient formula that there is just one being, one substance, one osia, as the Greeks said, but comes to us in three persons. That's really important, that his nature is that he's all-powerful and all-knowing. His character is that he's loving and holy and just. His actions are that he is the creator of all reality, that he made reality, he made the universe out of nothing, out of the thoughts of his head, not some prior existing material, and that he visited the world in the person of Christ. So I think that's a really important foundation right there. And then secondly, I want to say that Christian ethics, the Bible isn't just a rule book, it's not just a morality book, it's a story. And so Christian ethics come to us along the storyline of the Bible, and I want to just summarize with that a bit of that here in my presentation. So God creates man and woman in this garden paradise, and very unusual for the ancient world that the woman would have as much dignity and value as the man, Adam and Eve here. And whether you believe in a literal Adam and Eve or they're more symbolic for something else doesn't really matter to my argument here. And the goal then was for man and woman and their offspring to live in this harmonious family-like relationship with God, but they rejected God. They divorced themselves from God, and in essence, what they're saying is, we want to be God. We want to have all the rights and privileges that you have, and so we're going to strike out on our own, and God, who won't force them to stay in the garden, said, okay, well, exercise your free will. Go ahead, reject me. There's going to be consequences, but here you go. So the Old Testament story then, uh, one of the first major uh, events is that there is this massive flood. So after Adam and Eve leave the garden, they gradually sink. They and their descendants gradually sink into a state of decadence and wickedness that God wipes them all out. But he's not satisfied with that arrangement. So after Noah and his family start things over, God comes to this man, this nomad named Abraham, and he starts the process of reconciliation with Abraham and his descendants. And of course, that becomes the nation of Israel, and they're to be a holy people and a light to the nations, but they often fail in this. But as a way to help them along and to know how to live, God gives them the law of Moses. God gives them this, it's not just a moral law, but it does contain moral commandments. Well, the Old Testament story continues then. Maybe a summary of these commandments could be given by the Ten Commandments, or the summary of the law given by the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments provide a broad summary. So forbidden, for example, I won't go through all of them, are idolatry, violating the Sabbath, dishonoring your parents, murder, adultery, stealing, lying, and coveting almost anything that your neighbor has, like your neighbor's house, wife, or possessions. And then you have this uh, Shema, this prayer of Israel, which maybe even focuses the law even more down to a finer point. The Shema captures the essence of God's heart. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So it reminds me that the relationship between God and his people isn't just one of dry, mechanical obedience. It's meant to be a family. That was the whole idea from the outset, that God would create people to be in a familial relationship with him. Well, in the Old Testament, time and again, you have God warning the people. Sometimes he uses prophets, sometimes he speaks directly to leaders, but he keeps warning them, keep the covenant, don't fall into the idolatrous and evil practices of the other nations, be faithful, be faithful. And if you don't, there are going to be consequences. And so you have lots of warnings. The whole Old Testament is full of warnings. And then the people seem to obey at first, but eventually they fall away, and then judgment comes. God is patient and long-suffering, and then finally he carries out his judgments. And you see these against the other nations, like Canaan and Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, but also his own people, 
carries out his judgments against his own people. And then this law of Moses and all the ethics of God, there's hints in the Old Testament that it points forward to some greater fulfillment yet to come. And we'll see that in the New Testament. So if you want to skip ahead, Mike, to slide number seven. In the New Testament then, uh, Israel trickles back to its, it's been exiled, it trickles back into its land in the 6th and 5th centuries, and then you have 400 years of silence. 400 years for the people to get ready for the process to begin again, and it seems like they don't do a very good job of that. Well, Christ then uh, comes. He comes to teach, perform miracles. He comes to die, comes to rise from the dead. And his teaching fulfills and, in a sense, supersedes the law of Moses. So insofar as the law of Moses it was for the people, it's for that time, yet a greater reality is envisioned and is hinted at in the law of Moses, and that comes in the person of Christ and his ethical teachings and how he fulfills it in his own person. So he comes to teach, perform miracles, die, and rise from the dead, and he elevates the cultural value of women and foreigners. You see hints of that in the Old Testament, and it comes to a stronger statement of that in the New Testament. He commissions his, his followers then. You, you all proliferate the teachings that I've given you. I want you to share them with the world. And then he goes back to the Shema. Remember that fine point of the Shema? Jesus takes it a step further. Yes, love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, and soul, but also love your neighbor as yourself. Both of those are quotes from two places in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6, I believe, and one other place, and Jesus puts them together. So it's love God and love your neighbor. And then other teachings of Jesus include uh, forbidding hate. Now, he takes, yeah, don't just murder. We know that's wrong. But he's elevating a little bit. It, it's even wrong to hate. Hating your brother is, in a sense, committing murder. Or he takes the sin of adultery and he elevates that. And even if you just lust after another person in this inappropriate way, uh, that's the new standard that Jesus has set. So I just wanted to put some ethical teachings of Jesus on a slide. So slide number nine. Uh, here's eight, and there's probably, there's many more. I, this is just a sampling. So love God and neighbor, as I mentioned. Love your enemies. In other words, go beyond loving those for whom it's easy to love. <laughs> love your enemies. I find that difficult to do. Forgive others. Do not judge others. Turn the other cheek. When you're struck on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Uh, he gives some status. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's better to give than to receive. Seek first the kingdom of God. There's many others. Just wanted to give you a sample of the ethical teachings of Jesus. Well, what is Christian theism's relationship to naturalism? Slide 10, God the creator who came in the person of Christ is really the ultimate standard of morality. There is no other standard by which God can be measured. So Tom and I have been going back and forth on this and he disagrees with me on this, but I thought it'd be helpful to at least say, yeah, not just what is Christian teaching in isolation, but kind of how does it relate to the other side here? And then a personal God provides morality to personal beings. So I really like to use the word personal in my uh, dialogue with Tom. Second way that relationship to naturalism, nature by itself may reflect the goodness and orderliness of God. So Tom is going to argue that nature itself gives us an ethical basis. That might be true if God has placed his ethics in nature, in the goodness and the order of nature. But nature itself doesn't give specific guidance for moral behavior. Nature doesn't tell me whether or not to cheat or lie. Moral feelings of guilt or anger may be at some injustice that I might be seeing. If those really are true, and if they point to a morality beyond ourselves, I believe those moral feelings are given to us by God. He gave us a conscience. And when we pay attention to that conscience and we see injustice in the world, it, something rises up in us and we want it to change. So, Maybe some questions that I have of Tom and in different ways I've asked these of him in our uh, debate in the book we're writing. Uh, 
what is the, I, I'm kind of searching for the location and the content of ethics. So what is the earth made of? Crust, mantle, core. And I would ask the naturalist, which of these three provide moral guidance? Which of them tell me how I should treat other people? Or to go further in nature, which animals give moral guidance? Is it sharks? Is it lions? Is it golden retrievers? Is it pit bulls? Which of these provide moral guidance? Which of them tell me how I should treat other people? What is the specific advice that I be, could be getting from nature if there's no real content there? Thirdly, which landscapes give moral guidance? Is it mountains? Is it bodies of water, fields, valleys? Again, what is it in nature that gives moral guidance? Which of them tell me how I should treat other people? What is the specific advice? Uh, which parts of atoms give moral guidance? Is it the protons, the neutrons, the electrons? Which of these provide moral guidance? Which of them tell me how I should treat other people? So those are some of the questions Tom and I have been kicking back and forth, hopefully in a respectful way. And uh, let me just close out here by saying some of my questions. Where is the law of morality located? Is it located in rocks or sharks or subatomic particles? And how did this law of nature that Tom is going to argue for, how did it come to be? What is its origin? Is it just inherent in nature? It seems to imply, if it is, that nature has some order and purpose. But if nature does not have order and purpose, how can random, purpose, purposeless nature provide moral guidance? Uh, I don't want to go over my time period here too much, Tom. <laughs> so uh, let me just close out here by saying, how can nature communicate with us? I know Tom believes that, as I mentioned, morality resides in nature. And maybe we can test for it in some way. But how is the content of that morality communicated to us. Or maybe the moral law exists in human nature. I mean, that would be another way to play it. I'd be interested to hear Tom's thoughts on that. But I want to know, how could humans have a nature, if they're just made of matter and energy, just atoms and molecules, how can humans have a true human nature? Atoms and molecules don't have a human nature, per se. They don't care. And it seems to me that on the naturalistic model, we're just glorified robots. Uh, let me see here. Let me just uh, close with a statement from a couple prominent atheists here, slide 20. Uh, Richard Dawkins, famous Richard Dawkins, the universe has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. It's one thing for our a theist to accuse naturalists of saying that. But when an atheist says it, I think it maybe carries more weight. Or Michael Roos, the world is just matter in motion. It has no meaning. It has no values. The world is like a machine. Or Thomas Nagel, the famous atheist philosopher, if evolutionary biology is a physical theory, then it cannot account for the appearances of consciousness. And Nagel goes on to say, how could nature, how could nature start to Think. How could inanimate matter start to think? How could consciousness arise from there? And I know Tom would like to address that. So biblical ethics are embedded in the biblical story. It's not just a morality book. And uh, I guess one of my big questions for Tom is exactly what part of nature, where is Tom's morality located? So if I went a little over time, my friend, I apologize. I was trying to... <laughs> get through it. So. I wasn't keeping track, so I have no idea if you went over time or not, but... <laughs> All right. So today's topic is objective morality, and the question is whether or not objective morality is better explained by a god, theism, or naturalism. And to do that, we have to answer a few questions first. So objective morality without God is a controversial topic for many theists. There's many of them who can't even imagine what that would be like. What, what would it even mean to have objective morality without a God? It can't, nothing even comes to mind. It seems like a vacuous topic. So let's uh, address that first. The, this is an argument from Frank Turek, very famous 
Christian apologists it exemplifies this, that if God does not exist, objective morals and values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God must exist. This argument makes it very clear that if God doesn't exist, there's no other possibilities for objective morality. Can't even think of one. It's not even imaginable. But is that really the case? It may come as a surprise to many, given the quotes Rick gave from many prominent atheists, that actually, most academic philosophers are atheists, and most academic philosophers believe in objective morality. So Rick listed three academic philosophers, very well known, very prominent, um, but they don't actually represent the majority. So even though Rick's quotes are very much don't believe in objective morality, and they are atheists, they are not the majority. So most philosophers are atheists, about 67%, and most philosophers believe in objective morality. Moral realism is objective morality, it's the technical term, 62%. So while Rick did quote three very prominent atheist philosophers who do not believe in objective morality, there are a whole bunch more who do. So there are many different models of objective morality of what could ground it. Um, naturalistic moral realism, objective consequentialism, moral intuitionism, virtue ethics, ethical naturalism, all of these are potential grounds of objective morality that exist without a God. And they, don't, they do not need a guide for any of these. Here's a list of a whole bunch of others. Not all of these are objective models of morality, just a big list of models of morality that I found on Wikipedia, but a lot of them are. So different models of objective morality are extremely common and understanding that many of them are objective is also extremely common in academic philosophy. So Frank's argument, if God does not exist, the objective moral values do not exist, is just false. If you can just imagine an alternative, then that premise is false. This is why academic principle or academic moral argument looks like this. There are objective moral facts and values. God provides the best explanation of the existence of objective facts and values, therefore probably God exists. This is the academic version of the argument because academically we all acknowledge that there are other possible ways to imagine what could ground objective morality. So what is morality? Morality is the principles that differentiate right from wrong. How do we tell what's good and bad to do in a given situation? Um, what does objective mean? Objective means stance independent truth. It means it's not about your opinion. What do you think? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite type of food? Favorite coffee? Favorite drink? Favorite painting? All of these things are subjective. They're contingent on what you think, your opinions, your thoughts, your values. Objective is the opposite of that. This chair objectively exists no matter what you think about it. Even if you don't like the chair, even if the chair you imagine it doesn't exist, even if you're in the matrix and you can, can't see anything, the chair will still exist because it exists objectively, independent of opinion. So objective morality is stance-independent moral truths or stance-independent principles that differentiate right from wrong, meaning that you have to be independent of any conscious agent's opinions, positions, thoughts, or feelings and God, in case you didn't know, is a conscious agent, which means if God's morality, if God is a conscious agent and morality is dependent on God, then morality is subjective. This is, seems to be like a big problem when we're talking about objective morality, because if God, being a mind, determines what is morality based off of his conscious thoughts, then that by definition means it's subjective. It doesn't matter how powerful God is, or if he created everything, or if he's morally perfect. If God, if morality is contingent on God's thoughts, Morality is subjective. So what would make morality objective? An objective grounds of morality would be like the chair. It has to exist independent of what anybody thinks about it. Like a laws of physics, a natural force, a platonic object, an a priori abstract supernatural field, like karma, if you've heard of that. If these things exist, they would all be objective basis of objective morality. The question is, given all these alternatives, including God, and the big list I left earlier, how do we determine which one is the best explanation of morality? Well. Evidence. Evidence would clearly be the best explanation. The evidence we have of objective morality breaks down into three big categories. Uh, moral intuition, moral progress, moral dilemmas, and philosophical distinctions. Moral intuitions are the feelings you get. You see somebody steal candy from a baby, like, that's, that's wrong. You shouldn't have done that. That's a moral intuition. Moral progress is the one I find the most interesting. It's the changes in moral intuition over time across cultures and even in animals. We see moral progress and in moral intuitions in animals. Studies have been done on monkeys and chimpanzees, elephants, dolphins, and they all exhibit moral intuitions and moral progress very similar to what humans do, which to some may be surprising if you don't consider animals to be moral agents, which I do not know exactly if the Bible implies that or not. It seems kind of ambiguous, but I believe that given a good theory, it should incorporate the fact that animals are morally significant, just like humans are. 
Uh, here's a bunch of lists of philosophical distinctions, principles and morality that we use to try to build a model of evidence. These are the data points that we use to try to like map which direction we should go to follow the evidence. Um, and here is a list of things that we can do to establish whether one theory or hypothesis is better than another. Does it answer big questions in the field of ethics? That's important. If it can do that, it's probably a good theory. If it can't do that, then why even call it a model of ethics at all? Another is if it's following the evidence. We've got to look at all the data points, plot them out, and say, well, does this follow the evidence or does it diverge from the evidence? Following the evidence would be good, diverging would be bad. And another way is if we take the model and follow it to its extreme, what would it describe the perfect world as? That would be a good indicator of whether or not we can assess that this is a good model or a bad model. So here is a big problem in the field of ethics. There are three uh, moral problems here. The trolley problem, there is a trolley heading down the tracks, it's going to hit five people and kill them all, and there's a switch next to you, and if you pull the switch, the trolley will be diverted down a different track, but there's only one guy. And the question is, is, is it moral to pull the switch? And most people say yes. That is typically the moral response, is yes, it's moral to pull the switch, even if it kills one guy. But a very similar problem is the fat man problem. The trolley is heading down the tracks, five people down the tracks, and there's a very rotund man standing right next to the tracks, and if you push him, he will stop the tracks, but he will die in the process. Is it moral to push the fat man? Typically, people will say no. Similarly, the doctor problem, a healthy person walks into a hospital, all perfectly great organs, and there are five dying patients who each have a different disease relative to a different organ, heart disease, lung disease, stomach cancer, whatever, and we can kill the healthy person, take all of their organs, and cure all of the five other people. Is it moral to kill this guy? The answer is typically no. So the question, in the field of ethics is why is it moral in the case of the trolley problem, but immoral in the case of the fat man and the doctor problem? Now, what does the Bible have to say about this? Can the Bible give us an answer? Why is one of these moral and the other two not immoral? What's the difference? What are the principles we can use to establish which is the correct moral answer, which is the incorrect moral answer? I don't know. I have never seen a way to answer this using Bible text. Maybe there is one, but my model definitely gives an answer to this, specifically that the switch all you're doing is diverting a natural force, the trolley. In the case of the fat man and the doctor, you were perpetrating the act, which is what makes it immoral. So mine can answer questions in the field. Uh, here's another good, the second point I mentioned is, do you follow the pattern of evidence or do you break it? So suppose we have a whole bunch of data points, those are the blue dots, and we try to plot a consistent pattern in between the blue dots, those are the red dots. A good theory is gonna be one that follows the pattern. We want something that, yes, look at that, the pattern continues, that's good theory. A bad theory is one that goes completely the opposite of the pattern, especially if the thing going the opposite is the core of the theory. If the core of the theory is doing the opposite of everything the evidence indicates, it's probably a bad theory. So. Philosophical pattern of morality, I'm going to give you an example of some of those data points. Imagine there's a doctor in the 1800s, and he's trying to save your life. You've been shot in the leg, and he wants to save your life. All he can do is cut your leg off. He doesn't have access to antibacterials, doesn't have access to modern medicine. The best he can do is cut your leg off to try to save your life. Now, however, if you imagine a modern doctor trying to save your life, if he cut your leg off in the same way an 1800s doctor would, you would sue him for malpractice, because he has access to antibacterials, to ways to save your life without causing excess harm. So what is the pattern here? The pattern is that a modern doctor has more power. He, she has access to a way to fix your leg without removing it. The more power you have, the less justified you are to cause excess pain and suffering. That's the pattern. So if you plot that out on a graph, there's many, many more examples of this. It's not just these two, but I just picked these two as an example. If we look justified harm on the right, the more higher you go, the more harm you're allowed to cause. An amount of power, the more to the right you go, the more power you have. The 1800s doctor, you notice he's allowed to cause a lot of harm justifiably because he doesn't have very much power. Whereas the modern doctor has a significantly more power, and so there's less harm that's justified from the modern doctor. Now, if we're going to put God on this graph, he has infinite power, so he's going to be as far to the right as he could possibly go, and based on the Bible, he's allowed to cause as much harm to you as he wants, which means he'd be at the very, very top of the graph. Now, if you notice, that is not following the pattern. This is the exact opposite of the pattern of morality that we're looking for, which seems very, very strange. Maybe not the best model. Maybe we want one that follows the arrow. So, 
Here is a bunch of other principles. If you take these principles, each one of them is a different graph with a different set of patterns that we could all follow and try to infer what the model of morality is. And in each case, it seems like God inverts the pattern or switches the pattern or is the opposite of the pattern. He doesn't follow the pattern. And so it seems very strange to conclude that God is the grounds of objective morality when it goes against all of the patterns of evidence we have of morality. In fact, I don't even think it's possible to start with the evidence of morality of any part, of any of the principles, any of the moral intuitions, and lead to a God. I've never seen it done. So a good model of morality is one that would continue the pattern, follow the evidence. A bad model is one which completely goes the opposite of the pattern, and God seems to go the opposite of the pattern, as far as I can tell. Ooh, next slide. The starting with your conclusion. So the reason I think this is, from my perspective, it seems like People who are religious start with their conclusion. They have a belief, it's very powerful, very, emotion, very emotional for them, and so they say, I believe God exists, and I, because I believe God exists and I believe the Bible, and the Bible says God is the basis of immorality, therefore God is the basis of morality. They are starting with their conclusion instead of starting with the evidence. This is a big problem in science. We have very good rules to say, don't do this. Don't start with your conclusion. You want to start with the evidence, follow the evidence wherever it leads. Don't start with your conclusion. Uh, another consequence of starting with your conclusion is something called special pleading. Special pleading is an informal fallacy where one cites something as an exception to a general rule without justification. Here are some examples. God may have some unknown reason for doing this. God's ways are higher than our ways. God can do what he wants with his creation. Are these actual justifications or actual reasons to justify the exception? Well, no. To say that God has an unknown reason is like saying, Oh, look, a UFO. It must be aliens. Well, if it's unidentified, you can't then identify it as aliens. That's a contradiction. Same thing applies to an unknown reason. There's an unknown reason why God did something that isn't the reason you know about. That's an admission you don't have a reason. The same thing applies to God's ways are higher than our ways. If there's some way that God is that is higher than us that we don't understand and we don't comprehend, again, that's an admission we don't know of a reason. We just assume there's one. God can do what he wants. God can do what he wants with his creation. This one is, uh, again, something that seems like it breaks all of the patterns of morality as far as I can tell. The global flood is a big one for me. Um, in the global flood, there were lots of people of all ages, and God drowned them all. That seems horribly immoral. I don't understand how something that could do something so atrocious could be the grounds of objective morality. How could a perfect moral being kill lots of people, especially since he has the power to solve a problem without killing them. In each of these cases, God could have done something different than murdering all of them. He could have just teleported them away to their own planet where they could do whatever they want on their own individually without harming anybody else, without killing anybody. Here is a list of a couple other ones which are just as atrocious. And here's an example of one where God's commanding us to do something which seems very bad. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. This seems bad. This seems like it can't be a basis of objective morality. Whatever wrote this, definitely not the basis of objective morality. The way my model would have wrote it would be something like, owning a person of property is immoral, beating them is more immoral, thou shall not own another human being's property. Now, which of these sentences seems like the better continuation of what we think of as moral? The third thing I mentioned before of what makes a good model is if we're following the pattern of evidence, what would make you describe the perfect world? So I want to give you a description of what I think a perfect world would look like. A perfect world would be a, a world where it is impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. Everyone, all conscious agents, including God, start in their own world, which they can design however they want, and it's immoral to create any conscious agent that is intellectually unable to consent. That means children, people with mental handicaps, animals that don't have adult level intelligence of humans. All conscious agents start with the adult level of intelligence and knowledge, and they all get their own world, and it is impossible to force any of them to do anything they don't consent to doing. This is what I think the perfect world looks like. Let's compare this to a Christian worldview. A Christian worldview, people are born into this world, Earth, without their consent. Presumably, we didn't consent to be here. 
and we were placed in a position where we suffer a great deal of physical and emotional harm for many, many years that we did not agree to. This seems, this seems bad. And many of these people who are sent here without their consent are sent to hell without, again, without their consent. And this is a common argument that I hear from many theists is that, oh, but they chose hell. God gave them the option. You can believe in me or go to hell. Well, that's not, that's not an option. Consider the analogy, like if I told you to give me $5 or I'm going to punch you in the face, if you do not give me $5, does that mean you consent to being punched in the face? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. So the fact that we, God may have given us a choice, that choice isn't us consenting to the alternative option that we don't want. All right. Uh, there's also this heaven. So heaven is the important part. How do we describe what a perfect world looks like when we look at scriptures? Well, it says some things like, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for you for those who love him. God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things that passed away. Okay, but what does this actually look like? It says, no bad stuff. Great. I like, I like no bad stuff, but... What are the principles that determine what this place looks like? How, what kind of freedoms do you have? What kind of rights do you have? It doesn't say. It just says, it's going to be the best thing ever, better than you can imagine, just trust me. So my conclusion, uh, the God model does not seem to answer any of the big questions in the field of ethics. It seems to invert all of the patterns of morality that we see in the evidence, and God does not give a coherent description of what a morally perfect world looks like as far as I can tell. Mine seems to be able to do all of these things, and so I believe that a naturalistic explanation of morality that follows the evidence, rather than starting with the conclusion, is a better explanation of what grounds morality. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. You can imagine the process of him, him and me going back and forth writing this book together. Uh, You've got to defend your views uh, in a project like that. Let me uh, respond to some of uh, what Tom has said. I can organize my notes. Uh, Tom said that most philosophers, professional philosophers in the English-speaking world are atheists. That's, that's probably true. I, I would agree with that. But the survey that he's referring to uh, surveys asked 7,500 philosophers to respond, only 750 1,750 did, maybe one in five responded. And then of 1,750 philosophers who responded, uh, in general, only 15 answered the question about whether or not you're a theist or an atheist. So a really small sample size to draw a conclusion from. And then Tom talked about objective morality, morality being stance independent, and he used the example of a chair there. I would agree with that. I, I'm wondering exactly what stance independent means, independent of any conscious agents, opinions, positions, thoughts, feelings, and God is a conscious agent. I, but I'm wondering if God is the same kind of conscious agent that we are. It almost seems like apples and oranges here. We're the bag of apples. God is the orange. And now the orange is going to get thrown in with the bag of apples because supposedly we share this trait in common Consciousness, but I'm wondering if God's all knowing consciousness is relevant enough here in this idea, relevant enough to be considered one of the apples. If he's the orange, can he be put in with the rest of us apples because of consciousness? But I'm wondering if his consciousness is really the same as ours. I don't think you can lump God in with human beings just because they're all conscious beings. The God of Christian theism is actually the source of moral truth. That's, that's what we believe. It's grounded in God's character. Well, no human being could claim that. None of the apples could claim that. But in this case, the orange uh, can claim that or is making that claim. So something can only be true if it's true in the mind of God. God can't have false knowledge, I would say by definition. God has a complete understanding of all truth. He has an unlimited perspective. No human can say that. So I guess what I'm saying is that God's perspective isn't just one among many perspectives. God's consciousness isn't just one among many consciousness. It seems to be very unique in that it can actually generate uh, actual 
truth. So is God's morality subjective? Tom said that God's morality then isn't objective. It's subjective. It's stance dependent. So truths in the mind of God are roughly like truths in the mind of limited human beings. That seems to be the implication. Everyone has a perspective. The question is, is God's perspective the same as human perspective in the relevant way? Maybe in some generalized way it is, but in the relevant way, is it really the same? Um, Well, let's just say that God's perspective is subjective. It seems like what Tom is saying is something like a law of physics would be objective. Well, in the Christian worldview, that would be a strange move, that God, whose perspective is subjective, could create the laws of physics and that they would be objective, and that Tom might derive some meaning out of a law of physics. He might say that there's a law of morality in nature, and law, a law of physics would be an objective standard for morality. And I'm saying, well, now you've got a subjective God creating an objective law of morality from which we derive our objective moral truths. Well, that, that seems very strange to me. It seems more logical to me that God really, that the thoughts in the mind of God really are objective. That's, that's objective reality and that you can't reduce God just to a perspective like we have. Um, okay. A lot of paper here, a lot of shuffling paper here. I want to talk about power. Tom said that the more power you have, the, l- the less justified you are to cause pain to other people. Okay, well, that seems like a good moral intuition overall to me, but there might be some exceptions. Sometimes causing pain is justified. Let's just say uh, Russia, which is very strong, attacks the Ukraine, which is a weaker military power. And let's just say the United States has more power than either one of them. Would it be appropriate for the party with the most power here to go in and exercise some level of harm against Russia. That might be a way, it uh, might be an exception to Tom's rule here, where there's kind of a justice thing happening here. The, The party with the most power really should exercise its power against an injustice, and that might cause some harm. Same as with bullying. If I see a kid being bullied, and I have the most power in the room, if I have the power to restrain the bully, Even if the bully is harmed in the process, am I not morally obligated to stop the bully? Let me skip ahead to the atrocities of God in the Old Testament. This is the toughest one to answer for Christians and Jews because on a surface reading, maybe even more than a surface reading, some of these passages are brutal. They're, they're difficult to handle. So I just want to acknowledge that it's, it would be wrong to just dismiss these passages and say, oh, they're no big deal. We've got a perfect solution to every one of them. We don't. And yet, philosophers, theologians, Bible scholars have really dug into these issues and at least given us a way through. Let's take the conquest of Canaan. Conquest of Canaan takes time before, takes place during the time of Joshua, and this is before the time of David. In fact, God had given the Canaanites 400 years to amend their ways. So if you go back to Genesis 15, uh, the promise to Abraham is that your descendants, the people of promise, are going to be enslaved for 400 years. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here to Canaan. For the sin of the Canaanites has not yet reached its full measure. So you can imagine God out in a field someplace with Abraham, and he goes, okay, there's going to be a delay here. You're going to get the promised land someday, but there's going to be a delay because the Canaanites, the sin of the Canaanites hasn't reached its full measure yet, and that's going to take 400 years. So in a sense, what he's doing is he's giving the Canaanites 400 years to come to their senses, to repent, and they don't. And so he goes in and drives them out. Romans 1.18 says, God's wrath comes upon the evil of the people. Those who suppress the truth 
with their evil. So you could make the argument that the Canaanites were suppressing the truth with their child sacrifice, with their aggressive tactics toward other nations that were just brutal, uh, with their prostitution, all of the things, their violence, the things that they were doing. And since when people look at nature, what God can be known is made plain to them. And it says, Romans 1.18, since the creation of the world, God's power and divine nature have been clearly seen from what has been made. So if you look at nature, you can learn something about God. Why didn't the Canaanites look at nature and learn something about the one true God? Instead, they continued in their evil practices. And after 400 years, God's patience ran out. And so he went in and drove them out, sometimes in violent ways. So people are without excuse. And it might seem brutal anachronistically for us to look back on 1300, 1200, 1100 BC to these brutal wars that took place. But <laughs> probably at the time period, it didn't seem that odd. That's what nations did. The gods fought in the heavens, and the, their adherents. Their followers on the earth fought each other. And so it's sort of to be expected, even though when we read these accounts, yeah, we want to throw up. I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. Yeah, it's really hard. Uh, the Canaanites were aggressive warriors. Uh, they sacrificed their children in the fire. What does that deserve? Well, then the question becomes, well, does that mean every man, woman, and child in these Canaanite nations, should they all be wiped out? And, I mean, I, I, I feel this, the, the, the force of that question, definitely. But if you actually read the accounts of Joshua, where it says every man, woman, and child was wiped out, that's probably just uh, warfare rhetoric. It's like, well, we, we slaughtered the Packers. Well, are the Packers still alive? Yes, but you use the word slaughter in a way that if you take it over literalistically, in a way that wasn't intended by the authors, you could come to the wrong conclusion. But here, we slaughtered the Canaanites, every man, woman, and child. But they probably didn't, because in Joshua 10, it says, we subdued the whole region and left no survivors. But in Joshua 23, it says, if you intermarry with the survivors of these nations, they will bring you down, and you will perish from this land. Well, this was God's land. Apparently, they didn't slaughter everyone. The whole directive from God was to drive them out of the land because it's actually God's land. He wants his people there to be a holy people, and he will inhabit the people that he places there. The other nations are driven out, and so it is done so violently. I won't go into the other texts. There's too many, but I just wanted to focus on that one, and I want to maybe step back and say, if you read the text in context and read the long thread of the text, they start to make more sense than kind of these arbitrary judgments, violent judgments given by God. He gives people warning, 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 warning. If you don't shape up, I'm going to act decisively against your sin and it's not going to be pretty. He says that through the prophets and others. And then they don't obey. And so at some point, his patience wears out and he does act violently and decisively against disobedience. And that's what we see in the scriptures. And of course, the Jews, they write the Old Testament as kind of a critique of themselves. The Jews are saying, yeah, we screwed up, and here's the story of it. Here's the 39 books of the Old Testament that shows pretty much how we, we screwed up. So God is long-suffering, God is loving, God is patient, but at some point his patience wears out, and that's where some of these passages come into play. Thanks. All right. So uh, there were a few questions Rick had for me, specifically, where in nature would morality be grounded? And he said, well, morality is something that is experienced by humans. Rocks don't experience morality. The earth doesn't experience morality. Protons, electrons, they don't experience morality. So how could morality be grounded in a nature which isn't conscious? Because its morality is only experienced by conscious agents. Well, let's compare another thing that's only experienced by consciousness, hunger. We get hungry occasionally. Uh, does that mean that hunger must be grounded in a god up there who's just starving all the time and imparting his hungerness onto us? Well, probably not. It's probably just a biochemical process in our stomach. The, do the, neuro, do the protons and neutrons in our stomach feel hungry? Well, no. Do the electrons? No. Does gravity feel hungry? No. But there's this thing called an emergent property where 
these physical processes in our stomach can send signals to our brain, and our brain responds with this feeling of hunger. And so the fact that we have certain conscious inclinations or feelings that are only experienced by conscious agents doesn't imply that it is required to be grounded in a conscious agent. It can be an emergent property of nature. And there's lots of these, feeling hot or cold. Is that something that we think is grounded in the garden? Probably not. It's probably just your skin. What about optical illusions? When you see the optical illusions in an art museum, does you think that that the misconceptions of your brain processing that information is grounded by a god, or probably just how our brains work and they make mistakes sometimes. There are lots of conscious experiences we have that we don't think are grounded in a supreme being. It's just a biological part of our brains. Our brains misfire or don't function. Illusions, delusions, misconceptions, um, all kinds of things. So why in the case of morality would this be any different? Why, why couldn't it be that morality is like hunger or any of the other things, an emergent property of some other physical laws interacting with our brain, like, say, a law of physics? Why couldn't morality be a field of physics like gravity that affects our brains? And if it did, Rick asked, how would nature communicate with us? Well, gravity communicates us with extremely effectively. If you want proof, just try to, try to fly, jump, jump off a building. See, Gravity has a pretty effective way of communicating to you. Why couldn't morality be the same? It is a force that permeates the universe and can interact with our brains, with humans, just like gravity does. It doesn't seem to be a problem there. Rick asked the question, is God's consciousness the same as ours? Because he's a supreme being who knows everything. Well, the, what makes something subjective isn't the size of the brain. It's a question of what makes something true, the truth maker of the statement. Is something true because God said it, or did God say it because it's true based off of an independent standard? If something is true only because it's said by a person, contingent on their stance, it's subjective. doesn't matter how powerful the person is, doesn't matter how they created the universe or if they're all-knowing. If it's only true because they said it, and no other reason, then it's subjective. Now, if it's true for some other reason, like he's looking at a facts book of the universe, like there's, there's a moral thing there, and he's just reading it off, that's the moral fact. That would be objective. He's, he's confirming the fact that is independent of him and saying it's true because of that, not because I said so. What, what makes something subjective is if it's true because the thing says so. What makes something objective is if it's true independent of the things say so. So it doesn't matter if God is bigger than us or more powerful than us or all-knowing. The fact that it's true because of his conscious say-so is what makes it subjective. Um, another point Rick mentioned is that if, in the Christian worldview, everything is created by God, including the force of gravity. And so if gravity was created by God, that would mean everything is subjective, which is something that I don't think is very, very nice. I don't think if we're in the Christian worldview that everything is subjective and contingent on God, that is very concerning to me. I would not want to live in such a universe. Um, causing pain, is causing pain justified? Rick listed the example of USA versus Russia, that this might be an exception to my rule. Well, let's, let's analyze that. Let's say Russia is invading Crimea, and USA has the current level of power we would be justified in sending a military force over there to fight, battle, and kill Russians in order to protect the innocent people of Crimea. Absolutely. But the principle is that the more power you get, the less justified you are to cause harm. So let's imagine you were, the USA was, um, I don't know, an all-powerful being. Would they still be justified in sending troops to kill the Russians? Well, no, because they could just snap their fingers and create a force field around Crimea. No deaths. Would the USA be justified in drowning Russia, both the military forces and the innocent people? Definitely not. We could just teleport them to their own world where they'd be safe. We could teleport Crimea to the other side of the planet, make it a part of Montana, problem solved. When you have infinite power, you can solve the problem without mass murdering the people. So in the case of the Canaanites, as Rick mentioned, let's say they were doing all of the bad things that Rick accuses them of, Testing. Is that working? So in the case of the Canaanites, let's suppose they were doing all of the bad things Rick accuses them of. Would it be justified to murder them all? Even if you give them years and years and years of warnings in advance, you've got to stop doing this, you've got to stop doing this, 
Is it justified to kill them all when you are an all-powerful being, when you can just snap your fingers and separate them all so that they can no longer harm anybody else? But no, it would not be justified to murder them all at this point because you're an all-powerful being. You can solve the problem by causing less pain or suffering. And so I don't think this is an exception that Rick says it is. I think it is actually a consistent part of the rule. If you're an all-powerful being, there are ways to solve the problem without drowning everybody. And so I don't think the drowning is a justified action. Thank you. Let's move our chairs up. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if you would like to text in a question, you can text that question to that number. It'll come to my phone, and we will get to as many as possible. Um, how many need some Tylenol because your brain hurts? Just raise your hand. We'll pass that out. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you both. That was uh, a very good. I looked. This is being recorded and will be on the Faith Covenant Church uh, YouTube page, so you can go back and, uh, and watch different parts of it. Uh, you can watch all of it if you like. Um, I have a number of questions. Thank you both for uh, your time. Um, you know, I, I have... No, no, I'll end with that. Um, for either Tom or Rick, no, Tom and Rick, um, the, uh, it seems that the naturalistic views of objective moral models are so numerous that they're evidently subjective, dependent on the perspective of the persons who observed and then developed the model. This statement assumes the models vary enough to indicate, indicate or warrant subjectivity and acknowledges that there was not enough time to unpack them. This is purposely not a question. That would likely result in too narrow a response. Do you have a response to what was said? I do. And if anybody wants to, we can stand up in line if you want to ask questions. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, that microphone. Yes, if you want to come, uh, just come up to the mic, and uh, rather than me looking at the phone, I will look at you. Yes, um, should I use this mic? Or? Okay. So... The fact that there are lots of differing opinions about a thing does not mean the thing is not objective. There are lots of different opinions about the shape of the Earth. There are many people who believe the world is flat. There are many different people who have different color spectrums. They can see things. Does the fact that many people see different colors mean that colors are subjective? No. People can have opinions that differ in lots of different ways. That doesn't mean that the things they're talking about are subjective. It just means that there might just be one that's right and a whole bunch that are wrong. Uh, for example, if you want to know what's wrong with the first Baptist church, ask the second Baptist church. <laughs> so if you want to talk about deviation in ideas, the Christian and religious ideas deviate just as much, if not more, than the atheist ones. And I wouldn't accuse theism of being subjective simply by virtue of the fact that there are so many variations. Okay. Any thought, Rick? I have nothing to add to that. It was well said. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question. Um, yeah, we'll get to as many as possible. Um, so uh, I'm going to take this question and expand upon it. Um, I think we, I under, we would understand from a Christian worldview why there is anything at all. Tom, from your perspective, why is there anything at all? Well, from my perspective, I think that reality is uncreated, just how Christians think that God is uncreated. So if I was to ask you, why does God exist at all? You would say, well, that's, that's a silly question. God couldn't not exist. He is there. He's not like it's a choice or there's a reason why he's there. He is necessarily there. I feel the same way about nature itself. I think that nature itself is a thing that could not exist. For there to be an absolute nothing, I think, is a contradiction. So there has to be some grounds of reality to facilitate everything that exists. And I think nature is that thing. And so to ask, well, why is nature there? would be similar to asking the question, well, why is God there? Okay. So um, here's the question that I have. I'm, I'm curious. 
Rick, you can respond from a Christian worldview, and then maybe, Tom, you can respond from your worldview. Um, do, do humans have free will, Rick, according to the biblical worldview? I think God has, let's just say by analogy, God has $1,000 worth of free will. I think he's given us $100 worth of free will. <laughs> and if we are locked in a physical universe where there is no God, then it's hard to see how there might be any free will. And I think Tom actually holds to that, although he might have a nuance on that that we need to hear. But God, we have free will because God has free will. God is the freest <laughs> free agent you could ever imagine. I watched football today, so I heard all about free agents. God is the ultimate free agent, but I don't think we have as much free will as God does. We're more limited by our location, our history, our culture, our biases, and so forth, and we end up kind of responding to the situation that we're in. And I don't think it's so, I don't think we respond in a way that is strictly deterministic, that those things determine, but they influence us. And we're not as aware of them as God is. So, you can mess with my $1,000 and $100. Yeah, if he probably has 10 times, way more than 10. And I'm just by analogy, God has a lot of it and he's given us a little bit, but it's a little bit that is significant. And then once you have free will, now you're responsible for your moral choices. You weren't like forced into them by some predetermined causes. Uh, you have a police department, you have justice, you have jurisprudence, you have all those things that hold people accountable for their choices. But if they're not accountable for their choices, then a lot of what we do in law enforcement and morality, to, to my thinking, doesn't make very much sense. Okay, Tom? So it depends on what you mean by free will. Because I believe that humans are, insofar as you are your brain, responsible for your moral actions. But when Christians say free will, it seems like they're talking about libertarian free will, that you are the ultimate cause of your decision to do one thing or the other. And to me, that makes no sense. I don't understand what that even means. Because if there are no prior determining factors in a particular decision, A or B, then that means it's random, just completely a random decision. And if there are prior determining factors, like you have some like for chocolate ice cream or vanilla, then those determining factors are going to cause you to choose chocolate over vanilla. And to say that there's this middle ground where there's this ability to make a choice and that, that ability to make a choice is undetermined and that you can just do it by your own innate ability. It doesn't seem to make sense. I don't even know what that means. How can you go from a state of choice to a state of no choice without it either being determined by other things or it being determined by nothing, in which case it's random, like that's a dichotomy. Either the choice is determined by prior causes or it is not determined by prior causes. If it's determined by prior causes, it's determined. If it's not, it's random. What's the third option? How can you even make sense of the question of a purely free choice? It doesn't even make sense to me. Okay. Um, yes. I remember when you and I first met that very first day, we went back and forth on this very thing for like 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I am, my guess is I've been in, uh, we're, you all are good Minnesotans, and um, you're, you would prefer not to come uh, up to the microphone because that would draw attention to yourself. Um, so could I get a volunteer? In fact, I'm going to just pick someone. Justin, would you be willing to take this mic and if someone raises their hand, bring oh. the mic to them. Uh-huh. And so if you have a question, just raise your hand. We will bring the mic to you. Thank you. I, so uh, we have some other questions. But before we go there, I actually would like to know um, why, how did you get to this point? Because you both got to a point where you wanted to stand before others and defend a worldview. Uh, Rick, why don't you start? How did you get to this point where you're here right now and you want to defend this worldview? I grew up a very nominal Christian, a Christian in name only. I went to church, some, but I didn't really believe it in my heart or my head. But some seeds were planted, and so at age 19, when some friends from high school shared Christ with me, it totally made sense, and I was kind of at a down point in my life, and I felt the internal self really being transformed and it came alive for the first time that I could remember. And that was so exciting to me. So I was just flying two feet above the ground, you know, for a year. Well, then I kind of woke up and like, well, wait a second, what did I do? Is this just an emotional commitment or is this really true? 
Then I started diving into this subject matter called apologetics that I'd never heard of before. I didn't grow up in that world. I didn't grow up as a philosopher or theologian. And I got really interested in the historical apologetics for Jesus, the philosophical apologetic for the existence of God, the existence of the world made by God and all those things. And then one thing led to another, and I'm in campus ministry, so students have a lot of these questions. So sort of by necessity, I had to dig into these matters and at least give them something to think about. And then it advanced even further when I became this traveling apologist for InterVarsity 15 years ago, where I mix evangelism with an apologetic flavor, and we do these sessions called Stump the Chump, and students can come and ask the chump any question they want about Christianity, and my job is to offer a thoughtful reply, and you work out answers, keep hearing the same questions over and over, and I'm still committed to the discipline of apologetics. I don't know that there's any one final, just perfect argument that is going to defeat the other side. Hence, Tom and I are writing a whole book on a topic related to apologetics, that being ethics. So there's a lot of back and forth to be had here, and I'm committed to the Christian worldview because I think it makes the most sense of the most data with the fewest problems, not only intellectually, but it speaks to the heart as well. So you have both the heart engaged and the head engaged and an interlocking of the two that just brings freedom to life. And I, I love that experience, and I love doing that with the people of God. Tom? Uh, so I was diagnosed with major depression. I had it since um, very early in my life. And I was researching philosophy, politics, biology, physics as a way to try to find a way out of that depression. I was also diagnosed with high-function autism, which made me very socially awkward. I wasn't very good at having conversations with other humans, especially about personal stuff, small talk. I was terrible at it, hated it. But I was pretty good at having conversations about philosophy. And so as a way to try to overcome my social anxiety, I would reach out to people who were well-versed in topics that I was also interested in, like Rick, about God and philosophy and politics and all those things, and have conversations in those spaces, like a coffee shop. And those interactions helped me to overcome my social anxiety because I could have conversations in places where I was comfortable, about topics that I was comfortable talking about. And that is the impetus for me doing these kinds of things is because I was using those as a way to build my comfortability with having conversations. And having conversations on stage in front of a lot of people was initially very nerve-wracking for me. Now I'm pretty used to it. And so I use these conversations not as a way to promote atheism as if I'm like an advocate for atheism, but as a way to practice my social skills and overcome my social anxiety. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's see. By looking at the chair you're sitting on, you can say it had a designer and creator. How can you, say, how can you therefore say humans, nature, universe, did not have a designer and creator? Very good question. So the fine-tuning argument, that is, this is a version of the fine-tuning argument, is when we look at things like the patterns of DNA, when we first discovered DNA, extremely complicated code, ATCG, looks like a pattern, looks like a language, and that made sense as an argument to look at this complicated system of letters that integrate in such a way that there's code that can then be read, looks like a language, completely justified to say that's probably a language. But since then, there were two competing hypotheses. This is designed by a god. This is a product of natural processes. One of these made predictions. If this is a product by natural processes, we should see the natural process of RNA forming on clay in this way. And then we discovered that process. If this is a natural process, we should see corpuscles forming in this location on their own. And we discovered that process. We should find RNA self-replicating molecules that form in nature up to a certain length. We find them. And all of these predictions were made by one of the sides and not the other side. So even though it may be intuitively, initially compelling to say that all oh, this was designed by nature, what really makes a hypothesis better is when it explains things we don't know yet and gets it right. And the one that does that isn't the designer hypothesis, it's the naturalist hypothesis. So the way I conclude these are not designed is because the naturalist hypothesis is the one making all the novel predictions that we don't know yet and getting it right consistently. Do you have any response to that? Yeah. Christianity and science go really well together. Science was launched mainly by theists, maybe not exclusively, but if you look back into the origins of science, it's theists 
Muslim theists and Christian theists, and maybe some others I'm not aware of, who looked out and saw an orderly world and thought, we should study this world. This would be a way to praise God and to understand the world that God has given us. So Christi uh, science got a really good start in, as a discipline that's compatible with Christian faith. So these days, if I want predictions, because Tom is very much interested in predictions, and you'll see that coming out in the book, then Christians have this tool in our toolbox that God has given to us as a gift. It's called science. So if the accusation is that the Bible itself doesn't make kind of these naturalistic predictions, it makes other kind of predictions, but not those, yeah, that's true. But, the, but science is available to the Christian as a gift from God, and so we can make predictions in pretty much the same way that Tom just laid out. Well, with my atheist friends, and I've had a ton, you're one of my reasons that I had a ton, I sometimes say to them, would I want science only? Or would I want science and God? And to me, the answer is easy on that one. Okay. Um, um, you can both respond to this, but let's start with you, Tom. Pascal's wager, if God exists, believing God results in great gain, while not believing results in infinite loss. If God does not exist, believing in God results in small loss while not believing results in small gain. Thoughts? Yeah, so Pascal's wager is very interesting. It's essentially, if God exists and you believe in him, you go to heaven. If you don't, you go to hell. If God does not exist, whether you believe or not makes no difference, you go to nothingness. The problem with this argument is that it's comparing a specific kind of a God with a very general kind of naturalism. So for example, the Christian God, if you believe in the Christian God. If there's lots of kinds of gods, you believe in the wrong one, you go to hell. And just as there could be many different types of gods, there could be many different types of naturalism. So there could be a heaven without a god. There are many different naturalistic views of like karma, reincarnation, uh, dharma, where the fundamental nature in Hinduism isn't a god, it's a field of some kind, it's a natural field. And there could be a heaven with a natural world with no god, and it requires no belief. So it could be the case that if there's no god and there's just this heaven, whether you believe or not makes no difference, you go to heaven. And so just the, the argument is flawed in the fact that it's comparing just the Christian kind of God or just the kind of God that only accepts believers to a general kind of naturalism that doesn't particularly say there's a heaven or hell or anything. When really, when you compare both apples to apples, where there's a particular kind of God who only lets people in who believe to a particular kind of naturalism who only lets people in who believe, you'll get the exact same probabilities. Or if you compare a general kind who lets anybody in, exact same probabilities. So for any variable you pick of what is required to get interest into heaven, say, pick your nose on a Tuesday. Everybody who picks their nose on a Tuesday gets into heaven. If there's a God who selects for that, the probability of getting into heaven is the exact same as if there is a nature that has a heaven that only people who pick their nose on a Tuesday get in. So the probabilities of Pascal Wager are exactly the same when you compare them in the same way. The only reason it looks compelling is because if you compare a specific kind of a God to a very general kind of naturalism or an assumed naturalism without a heaven, then it looks bad. Thoughts? Yeah, there's been many critiques leveled against Pascal's wager. Some say it's just, it's, it's a gamble. <laughs> and is belief in God kind of worth this very pragmatic gamble? That's been one of the critiques. Another of the critiques is that it doesn't cover all of the choices, just like Tom said, that was very well said. And Pascal probably created the wager maybe as an afterthought a bit in his, uh, I think it's in the Pensies, and it's in a Christian culture, and so it's sort of assumed that this would be the Christian God, but if it were thought, if it were created in world culture, you'd have all these other religions, just like Tom said. Probably the place where Pascal's wager is most useful is a person who's just teetering on the edge of belief. They sort of do believe, but eh, I don't know, they, maybe not. Uh, sometimes they're called yearners. You want it to be true. You think it might be true. You're almost there, but you're not quite there. You don't want to make that leap of faith. Maybe you've got some good reasons, but maybe the reasons aren't as many as you want. But Pascal's Wager says, well, you should go for it. Because if you're right, you get eternal life, and if you're wrong, nothing is lost. So that's probably maybe the one narrow area where Pascal's wager is most useful to the this, to this seeker who maybe wants to be a believer. I'm not really disagreeing with uh, Tom much on that one. Okay. 
Um, here's a question. This is a question from me and one of the, the persons kind of combined. Wife. My wife? No. <laughs> um, all right, Tom. So if, um, so in Denmark, my understanding is um, there are no more children with Down syndrome born in Denmark because it's now been figured out a way that those children can be aborted before they're born. Okay, so that's a thing. In light of that, is that wrong? Is it right? And within that, why does, a, why does a, any human being have dignity? So in my moral view, all conscious agents have value. Why? What? Why? Because it's inherent to objective morality. So just like, it's inherent oh. to objective morality. I see, okay. So I believe in objective morality, so I believe all conscious agents have moral value. And so anything that's conscious, whether it's a ants or a grasshopper or a human, they all have conscious value. So I think it's always wrong to kill anyone ever for any reason. Always wrong. Any conscious agent, if you kill it, you are violating its autonomy and you should never do so. Now, there are justified reasons to do so. If someone's attacking you and the only way to stop them is to shoot them, it's a justified immoral action. You're doing an immoral thing by killing them, but you're justified to protect yourself. In the case of abortion or in the case of Down syndrome, it can be argued that it's justified if their life would be so unpleasant or miserable that you would want to save them from that, unmiser that miserable life. And so it can be argued that it's justified. I don't really have a position on that, but my, my personal moral value is that any conscious agent has value and it's wrong to kill anything that's conscious ever for any reason, including a baby. Any response there, Rick? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, the Bible, I would say, generally frowns on abortion. There could be exceptions, but if it were me, if I were king for a day, I wouldn't base my views of abortion, or I wouldn't create abortion laws based on the exceptions. I would start with a general rule that Tom just laid out. Now, I would come to that dignity of human beings from a slightly different perspective. Yes, it's objective, but it's objectivity given by God, whereas for Tom, it comes from the natural world, the objective value of the natural world. So I think we're agreed on here. And so one of the things I get pressed on a lot is, well, do you believe in abortion? Well, no, because it's murder. Well, are there, what about the exceptions? Because they think, well, then there's no exceptions. And then I think we just need to have a side conversation about what sorts of exceptions we would have to be. And I'm not really equipped to tease that out right now. So I think Tom and I would generally look on this the same way that a, an unborn baby does have value that's given by God. And so we need to protect that. It's interesting that there, there's a sense of common ground Well, I know. There, that's, which is, is quite fascinating. It is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, we, he and I get to the same place on a lot of things from a, di from a different highway, you might sure. say. And so that's why the book has been interesting to, to do together. Tom, uh, one question. Uh, people are wondering, why, uh, what do, what's your view of what happens to Tom after Tom dies? Well, so I'm a naturalist. I think there is no current evidence we have of an afterlife. So I think the most likely explanation is we just go to the dirt and fertilize the flowers. But I think the probability of us going to heaven is equally as likely under naturalism as it is under theism. So I think that even if there's no God, the probability of you getting to heaven is exactly the same in naturalism, because there could be a heaven. We could be in the matrix. We could just die and wake up and we're in the matrix. I so I, don't, I personally don't think there's any evidence for a heaven, but I think there is equal likelihood to go to heaven under naturalism as there is theism. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. I think if you can make a good case for the historical resurrection of Jesus, then we've got something to say about heaven. If you can't make that case, and I'm pretty sure Tom believes that you can't, but I believe that you can make a very good case for it, then we've got a likelihood of, of heaven in front of us. Here's a, here's a question. Um, any, any hands raised? Anyone? Yeah, okay, right there. I texted it to you, but I'll read it. The Bible is one inspired book, and it communicates over 300 specific prophecies about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfills them all. So math, that's mathematically impossible. 
how would a naturalistic worldview explain that truth? So the prophecies about Jesus, actually many of them fail. Um, if you study the ancient Greek, there are many very prominent historians who study the prophecies in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic, like Bart Ehrman. The prophecies don't actually work. Um, the reason they do is because the translations done by many monks in monasteries in the 13th century added a whole bunch of things and moved translations around and cut out parts of the Bible they didn't like. And because of this thing called the natural ambiguity of language, you can interpret any sentence in many, many different ways. And of those ways, you can find the one that fits best, especially given Hebrew and Greek. Each of the words has about 30 different interpretations, 30 different meanings of the word. They don't have a strict single usage or two or three usages like we do today. Many words had many different interpretations. And so because of that, the way the Bible was rewritten in the mid-centuries mid actually tried to make them fit when they didn't. And we know this because of the oldest manuscripts we have in the Bible do actually differ quite significantly um, in many very important ways. And I would encourage people to look up the lectures by Bart Ehrman on those specific ways to show that they, they don't actually fulfill, are not fulfilled by Jesus. You bring up Bart Ehrman. Um, and what's interesting, so Bart, uh, I know someone who went to seminary with Bart Ehrman, two people, same seminary, and that very much disagree. And so, I'm curious from both of your perspectives, so just go with me. Uh, I'll, I'll let you go first, Rick. Rick, what is an, outside of Tom, who is an atheist who you think makes a pretty good argument? An atheist who makes a pretty good argument? What, 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 who, uh, what atheists out there do you think really make good, compelling arguments from your perspective? In general? Yeah. Uh, the ones that I listed, that I read, I read Thomas Nagel, I read Michael Roos. Um, I mean, those are two right there. Robert Price is a Bible scholar who's an atheist. I don't think his arguments are very good. And contrary to what Tom says, I don't think Bart Ehrman gives the data that we have a fair reading. He has a, has a very negative, cynical view of history. And so when history seems to have been distorted, when history seems to give us uh, very negative conclusions about the ancient world, uh, one of the criticisms of Bart Ehrman by people like Michael Lacona, for example, and Lydia McGrew, they, they have accused Bart Ehrman of such a cynical reading of history that if you apply that same cynical reading to the rest of history, the rest of history would fall apart. That's been the accusation against Bart Ehrman. And wouldn't it make more sense then to give history a more charitable reading to be open to what the possibilities are? Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, Tom, from your perspective, outside of Rick, what Christians out there do you think actually make pretty good arguments? There's actually quite a few of them. So um, Rob Coons, he's an expert in Thomism, uh, Thomas Aquinas. I debated him several times. He is extremely intelligent. I feel I probably struggled in our first debate, did much better in our second. So he makes very good arguments. Richard Swinburne, absolutely amazing philosopher. He makes very good arguments. Uh, Luke Barnes, physicist, expert in the fine-tuning argument. Um, Jeff Wierink, another physicist, expert in the fine-tuning argument. Hugh Ross, he's up there, but I wouldn't put him as high as the other guys. Um, I very much like William Lane Craig's like etiquette. I like so he's very intelligent. I don't like his arguments, but I think he's very very good at making them. Um, there are a number that I've debated who I think are very excellent. Um, Randall Rouser, I learned a great deal from him about fallibilism and his arguments there. Um, those are the ones I think that I that come to my mind first. Okay, we're just about out of time. Uh, I get the final question. <laughs> All right, and this is one for each of you. And you're, you're, gonna, you're both going to recognize that where this question came from. Um, I'll start with, oh, Ben, do you have a question? All right, go ahead. Then I'll ask mine. All right. I, uh, I wrote this all down on my phone while we're here, so I'm kind of uh, winging this. A little nervous. Um, so this is more of a question for Tom. Um, I consider you a very smart man. You carry yourself well, you speak well. Um, and the model that you use, I just have to say, is not that smart or justifiable. And the reason I say that is um, 
the model that uses evidence to say God is not moral also points to an impossible world. You were saying that a perfect world, according to your model, um, would be a world where um, children would have to consent to being brought into the world, couldn't do anything without their consent, um, like the house they want to grow up in would have to be their own. Um, uh, I'm kind of all over the place right now. Um, I just feel like for a child to be able to make the decision to come into this world, he would have to have, he or she would have to have knowledge of what this world is beforehand, would have to know the pros and cons of choosing life or not choosing life. Um, and I feel like that would be impossible for the child to already know that knowledge. Um, and what that essentially means, if I can find it in my notes here, um, I'm a little nervous, sorry, I can't really think too clearly. No problem, take your time. Not really sure. I promise this made a lot of sense in my head about two <laughs> minutes ago. But if a child has to consent um, to being in this world, he has to be able to know what he's got himself into. If he chooses to enter this world, um, he has to already know what this world is going to consist of. And therefore, he has knowledge that he did not consent to. Right? He's able to make these choices and have this knowledge that he had no consent of having knowledge over. And I feel like that itself is a very disproving argument. So then if that is an impossibility, the next moral and most reasonable way um, would be what I feel like what the Bible points to, where we are brought into without any, we're brought into this world without any knowledge, um, without our consent, but we are given a book that has a moral code that we can either choose to follow or choose not to. We can either consent to learn this knowledge that essentially gives us life. I guess um, in the Christian standpoint, that is life. In your standpoint, physical life is the life. Um, we can consent to choosing that life or choosing not. Um, and you used a metaphor that was... Um, you either give me five dollars or I punch you in the face. And that is not at all what God says. I feel like that's a poorly written metaphor. The metaphor is either um, you can choose to love me or you can depart from me, right? You can either choose to learn this knowledge or um, choose to not learn this. Hey, Ben, could, could Tom respond? Because we, uh, we're getting close to our time, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're good. And you could, I'm, I'm betting right when we're done, you, you can. Yeah, I might have to meet it. one on one because it's a little nervous up here in front of everybody. <laughs> All right, Tom, thoughts? Sure. So, um, as I said in my model, there would be no children. It would be immoral to create someone who was not able to consent. So, you would have to create someone who had an adult level intelligence. And the problem with what I think you said is that you said it's impossible. Now, it seems very strange to me to think that an all-powerful God, it was impossible for an all-powerful God to give you a knowledge of what this world would be like. That seems very strange. It seems like he's all-powerful. He probably could just snap his fingers and give you all the knowledge you needed. Now, I agree. He couldn't give it to you if you didn't consent. Um, so what we'd have to do is create you not in this world, create you in the perfect world, heaven or whatever, and then say, hey, would you like to go to Earth? I designed this place called Earth. It's got some, it's, it's not so great in some ways. Um, would you like to go there? Um, and then as an adult human, you'd probably be like, well, what's it like? And he's like, oh, I, I can snap my fingers and give you the knowledge of the world. Like, all right, all right hit me. And he snaps his fingers, gives you the knowledge, like, nope, not going. I'm good. This is good. I like this. No, no. Or you could say, nah, I don't really need the knowledge. I'm just going to, I'm chilling out. Nah, I'm not interested. Or maybe you could be like, you know what? I'm just, screw it. Let's go for it. I'll just go. go. I don't even need the knowledge. So it, there doesn't seem to be anything impossible about any of that. Like just, God could have just created us in a perfect place or without the suffering. And you don't need to consent to be created because if you don't exist, you don't need to give consent to exist. 
But after you're created, you need to have autonomy. You need to have your own world that you get to live in however you want. And God could then give you the option to come to this world. And he could give you the option to get the knowledge of this world. And so I totally agree it would be immoral for God to force you to have the knowledge without your consent. And it would be immoral for God to force you into this world without your consent. But there's nothing impossible about what I've just said as far as I can tell. Okay. All right. Last question. Sorry, Ben. You're going to have to do it when uh, follow-up. Uh, we're at 8.03. I do get the final question because I have the mic. Uh, Rick, if atheism turns out to be true, would you believe it? I would. Next question. Tom, if you found Christian to be, Christianity to be true, would you believe it? Absolutely. But I think the more, question, more important question is, would I worship and love God? Mm -hmm. No. I would be unable to worship and love a God who has done so many atrocious things. Ah. But I would absolutely accept it if it was true. Okay. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, we're going to end right there. Um, a couple things before you go. Reminder, uh, there's a book table out there. Uh, Rick has some books, and hopefully in the future we'll have you back, and we'll have your new book that you both have written and that you can share with everyone. Um, secondly, uh, as you leave, you're going to see two wonderful people standing at the door with baskets. That is called a love offering. Uh, these two gentlemen have gone uh, uh, to great lengths tonight to share their hearts and their minds with you, and we would love uh, to uh, offer them an honorarium uh, for their time. And so if you'd be willing to participate in that, that would be very helpful. Uh, why don't we give both of these gentlemen a big round of applause. And let's do this. Why don't you both head on out to the lobby first, and um, you're going to probably, some people would love to talk with you. And uh, um, you can do, we'll, we'll come get them from you. And I, I am, yeah, yeah, there you go. Isn't that nice? <laughs> One of, my, one of my favorite parts of, of this is that Tom and Rick are friends. I just, I just think that's really good. And uh, so thank you both for being so kind. And thank you all for being very generous in the way uh, you brought respect to both of them. I was, I'm very grateful for that as pastor of Faith Covenant Church. Uh, I am a pastor. This is a church. And so I'm going to close in prayer. Let's pray. Holy God, we are grateful for Tom and Rick. And we're grateful, God, that you've given us minds. Um, and there is truth, and we pray, Holy God, that you would, uh, that your Holy Spirit would draw us to understand truth. And you said, Lord, that if we seek you with all your heart, we will find you. And so we pray that each of us would seek after truth with all of our hearts. Amen. Have a great evening, everybody, and thank you. <laughs>